Hey guys, welcome back. Last time I demonstrated some small engines all the way up to five cylinders, and today we're picking up where we left off. But before we do that, I want to talk about some developments since my last video was released. I've been seeing a lot of people making YouTube videos with Engine Simulator showcasing their creations, and I just want to say this is honestly something that I never expected to happen, and everyone in the community has been really great. I've noticed some people getting into arguments in the comments about crediting me, and as I've stated, it really doesn't matter. Credit is appreciated, but not mandatory, but everyone so far has been really good about it, so thanks a lot, guys. Alright, with that out of the way, the first thing I have to do is apologize to Subaru owners. I realize my last video must have been very traumatic since I neglected to account for unequal length headers, which gives some Subarus their distinctive sound. Well, the simulation now supports unequal length headers, so let's try this again. First, just for the sake of comparison, I'm going to demonstrate a Subaru with equal length headers. Now, let's try unequal length headers, which causes the exhaust pulses from one bank to arrive later than the other and this creates a sort of rumble sound in the exhaust. Let's see what that sounds like. I know it's not perfect, but I think you can definitely hear the rumble now. Uh, but let me know what you think in the comments. Some people have also commented on the volumetric efficiency being too high for a lot of engines, and this is true. You can specify values in the simulator that will lead to unrealistically high flow rates in the engine, which is part of the problem. Also, it might seem counterintuitive, but you can actually have higher than 100% volumetric efficiency in real life with a naturally aspirated engine but that's sort of besides the point. Anyway, it's very hard to tune all of these parameters perfectly, and I don't have the equipment to measure them directly, so some of the numbers that you see are not going to be correct. I've calibrated everything a bit better for this video, but it's still not perfect. Alright, now that we got that out of the way, let's start looking at some more engines. We're going to start with perhaps the most famous inline-6 engine, and a lot of people suggested this, the 2JZ. This engine was first produced by Toyota in 1991, and since then has practically achieved legendary status. There's a big modding scene around two JZs, so I was able to find quite a bit of information about them. In terms of layout, they're a pretty standard inline six with a firing order of 153624. All right, let's see what that sounds like. <laughs> doing a study of V6s. But before we talk about that, I want to talk a little bit about even firing versus uneven firing engines. An even firing engine has the cylinder firing events spaced evenly in the cycle. So our 2JZ for example is even firing and you can see that the exhaust pulses are evenly spaced. A 90 degree V-twin on the other hand is not an even firing engine. Let's say that cylinder 1 fires at 0 degrees, cylinder 2 will then fire 450 degrees later instead of 360. And then to complete the cycle, cylinder 1 will fire 270 degrees later. This uneven firing changes the sound of the engine slightly. V6s are interesting because there are a few V angles that have been used by manufacturers. First let's take a look at a 60 degree V6 and see what that sounds like. Even though a 
60 degree V-angle is optimal for balance, some manufacturers have made 90 degree V6s. You might be asking yourself why this would ever make sense. Well, it's mainly for practical reasons and mostly from American manufacturers. Americans like their V8s, and while some people joke that V6s are just V8s with two missing cylinders, in some cases, this is quite literally what they were. Instead of designing an entirely new block, American manufacturers just took their existing small block V8 platforms, which of course have 90 degree V angles, and removed two cylinders to make a V6 block. In some earlier V6s, even the shared crank pins were retained from the V8 design, which meant that they did not even fire evenly. So let's listen to one of these odd fire V6 engines, as they're called. These engines have a very distinctive sound because of their uneven firing and are a bit unbalanced. Some manufacturers corrected this by splitting the rod journals, allowing the engine to fire evenly. Let's see what that sounds like. Next, we're going to look at V8 engines. Now, a lot of you wanted to see a demo comparing a flat plane to a cross plane V8. And the names for these two layouts come from the shapes of the crankshafts. In a flat plane V8, all rod journals are on the same plane, so the crank appears flat. Whereas in a cross plane V8, the rod journals are separated from each other by 90 degrees. Let's listen to an extremely popular cross-plane American V8 engine, the GM LS motor, or at least my version of an LS motor. Two things to notice are the rumble sound caused by unequal length headers and the odd firing order which does not alternate evenly between the left and right bank. Notice how at some points two cylinders in the same bank fire sequentially. This does not happen in flat-plane V8s as we'll see. Flat-plane V8s are more common from European manufacturers like Ferrari, although more recently some American manufacturers have been using them as well. I decided to demo a European flat-plane V8 since many American flat-plane V8s use exhaust system trickery to make them sound more like cross-plane V8s to appeal to American buyers who are more familiar with that sound. European flat-plane V8s typically have equal length headers, and that makes them sound uh, exotic in North America. Next, let's take a look at a 9-cylinder radial engine. It's fairly similar to the 5-cylinder radial that I showed in my last video, but of course it has 4 extra cylinders. This large donut-shaped device here is actually a single connecting rod, which is special and different from the other ones, and all the other uh, rods actually connect to this one instead of the crankshaft. And the reason for that is because there, there just isn't really a good way of connecting them all to a single crank pin. 
um, and this solves that problem. This next one was requested by quite a few people. It is a famous 10-cylinder Toyota engine that you can find in the Lexus LFA. This is an even-firing V10, which revs very quickly. And one thing that I'm working on is getting that rasp that you often hear from high-performance engines like this. Um, it's something that I'm working on for the final release of Engine Simulator. Anyway, see what you think. Finally, let's look at some V12s. 12 cylinders are pretty close to the limit of what the simulator can currently handle on my hardware, so I've had to lower the simulation resolution a little bit. You guys probably remember, uh, if you reduce the frequency too much, what happens from my first video about engine simulator. Anyway, let's try a famous V12, the Rolls-Royce Merlin, which was used in British World War II fighter planes like the Spitfire. These engines were usually supercharged, but since the simulation doesn't yet support forced induction, we'll have to keep it naturally aspirated. Alright, the final thing we're going to look at is a Formula 1 V12. In particular, this is the Tippo 044-1. I have no idea how this is meant to be said, but that's how I say it, uh, from the early 90s. It has a slightly odd 75 degree V angle, which is different from the 60 degree V of the Rolls-Royce engine that we looked at earlier. This engine definitely pushes the limits of what the program can do because it's very mechanically complex and it spins very quickly. And what tends to happen is the faster an engine spins, the more distance each of the individual components covers per frame, and it just makes the physics simulation harder to solve um, and, and more inaccurate actually as it spins faster. But it seems to handle it reasonably well, just with a few artifacts here and there. So let me know what you guys think. Alright guys, obviously there's still a lot of work to do and this is still very much a prototype. I've already started working on the real engine simulator and I really appreciate all the support I've been getting on Patreon. If you want to get a copy of the game and support the project, the link to my Patreon can be found in the description. 
In the next few weeks, I plan to publish one more video where I talk about all of the technical details of the project, since a lot of the software developers in my audience requested it. After that, I'll be focusing on developing Engine Simulator and putting out devlogs when I have a chance. Hope you guys enjoyed the video, and thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.